It was just after Christmas in Cleveland, Ohio in 1964, when a teenage girl went to her friend's home. They had made arrangements for that day, but when she knocked on the front door, she received no reply. She stood at the door for a moment, and then heard something peculiar coming from upstairs. It was Christmas break in Cleveland, Ohio in 1964. The 28th of December was a cold but dry day and children were off school, having celebrated Christmas just three days earlier. 16-year-old Barbara Klonowski had made arrangements to go to her friend, 16-year-old Beverly DeRose's home. Beverly lived with her family on Thornton Drive and from here Barbara and Beverly planned on meeting up with their other friend, Margie. At around 1.25 p.m., Barbara arrived at Beverly's home. She rang the front doorbell, but Beverly didn't answer the front door. Barbara noticed that the side door was open, but the storm door was locked. Barbara stood outside for a moment, and she could hear that the radio inside the home was turned on. It was very loud, and Barbara thought that this was odd. It was getting cold and Beverly wasn't answering the front door. Before Barbara turned to leave, she heard some strange noises coming from upstairs. It was a couple of loud thumps. To Barbara, it sounded like somebody had fallen over or a drawer had been slammed. By this point, Barbara was a little bit annoyed. Beverly had invited her over, but she wasn't opening the front door, despite the fact that Barbara could tell that somebody was inside. After a while, Barbara decided to leave. She walked to the corner where she met a friend who drove her back home. At around 3.45 p.m. that afternoon, Margie called up Barbara to see why she and Beverly were taking so long. Barbara explained the strange situation, and they wondered if Beverly was playing some kind of prank. After Barbara hung up, Margie called Beverly's grandmother and informed her that Beverly wasn't opening the front door, and they weren't sure where she was. Beverly's grandmother then placed a phone call to her son, Thaddeus, who was Beverly's father. At the time, Thaddeus was at work, but when he received that phone call, he sensed that maybe something was wrong. At around 4pm, he left his place of employment and returned home. He opened the front door and called out hello to his daughter. He received no response. The home was eerily quiet other than music blaring from the radio. The family had always kept the radio on the same station. But the music was different. Somebody had changed the radio station to a radio station that played rock and roll music. That wasn't the kind of music that Beverly or anybody else in the family listened to. Thaddeus thought that it was peculiar but he continued walking in the direction of the bedroom that Beverly shared with her 12-year-old sister, Carol. He slowly opened up the bedroom door, expecting to find Beverly possibly asleep. As his eyes transfixed on the bedroom, he recoiled in horror as he saw that it was splattered with crimson red blood. Beverly's bedroom was in complete disarray as well, as if some kind of struggle had taken place. As he walked towards the bed, he could see Beverly crumpled up on the floor. She was bound by a rope which was wrapped tightly around her neck and ankles. Beverly was lying face down on the floor beside her bed, and her body was saturated in blood. She had stab wounds peppered all over her chest and back, and it was evident that she had been the victim of a beating as well. The bedroom bore all the hallmarks of a struggle. Beverly was nude except for the upper half of a slip. Her torn clothing was littered across the floor. The rope had been cut into three lengths. One piece was draped across Beverly's body, while the other two were found underneath her.
Beverly was an 11th grader at Marymount High School, which was a Catholic girls' school. Beverly's friendly and welcoming nature earned her friends at school easily. As one said, Beverly was a very sweet girl. Beverly was also an intelligent girl and she always earned good grades. At just 16 years old, she wasn't quite sure what she wanted to do with her life. Something she did consider was going to college and teaching Latin. She even spoke with her mother one day about possibly becoming a nun. Beverly was a massive classic music fan, and she spent much of her free time writing poetry. She also loved jazz music, and she was very compassionate. She had been volunteering as a typist at the local hospital. Beverly's father, Thaddeus, owned the Universal Lighting and Manufacturing Company, while her mother, Eleanor, worked in a local office. The night before Beverly was killed, she had been in her bedroom, copying one of her poems into a leather-covered book, which had just been a gift from her father. That evening, the family had thrown a small gathering, which was attended by some neighbours. It was a Christmas tradition for the family. The 20th of December 1964 had started out like any regular day for the family. They had awoken that morning and shared breakfast together in the kitchen. Thaddeus and Eleanor then left for work, while Beverly and her sister did the dishes. Since it was Christmas break, Beverly and Carol were off school, and they visited their grandmother, Maria Vanek, who lived around a mile away. The sisters stayed here for lunch, and at around noon, Beverly was driven home from her grandmother's home by her grandmother's 18-year-old neighbour. She had arrangements to meet her friend Barbara at the home, and Carol stayed with her grandmother. At around 1pm, Beverly's mother, Eleanor, phoned home and chatted with Beverly. Nothing appeared to be amiss with her daughter. Shortly thereafter, a second person called. It was a man who identified himself as Stephen Stankiewicz, and he was looking for Beverly's father. Beverly informed the man that her father wasn't at home, and he said that he would call back later. Beverly wrote the man's name down on a piece of paper as a reminder for her father. A little while later, Eleanor called the home again and chatted with her daughter. This time, Beverly told her mother that she needed to hang up because Barbara was going to arrive at any minute. Barbara arrived at the home at around 1.25 p.m. She had been driven over by her mother, but she left when her knocks to the front door went unanswered. After Beverly was found dead, she was transported to the medical examiner's office for more details surrounding her death to be established. It could clearly be seen that she had been stabbed and beaten, but investigators needed to know whether she had been sexually assaulted or not. The murder scene was a particularly brutal and frenzied one, with Detective Captain William C. Horrigan referring to the case as the worst killing I've ever seen. The family's home was cordoned off with crime scene tape as the investigation got underway. In Beverly's bedroom, they found several bloody palm prints and fingerprints. They also found a chunk of plaster, which had fallen from the sloping ceiling over Beverly's bed. It was theorised that the plaster had been kicked loose as Beverly struggled with her killer. The fingerprints and palm print were sent off to be analysed. It found that the prints had not come from Beverly. Investigators brought in Beverly's parents and her sister to compare the prints to them, but they were not a match. Investigators working the homicide had already established Beverly's movements from that morning in the afternoon. The last time that she was seen was by the 18-year-old neighbour who drove her home from her grandmother's home. Investigators chatted with this neighbour and they ruled him out as a suspect. After he had dropped her home, Beverly had chatted with her mother twice. Investigators theorised that she was killed around 1.30pm, which was around the same time that Barbara was outside. Once the acquaintance was cleared of any involvement, investigators began looking at any potential boyfriends that Beverly may have had. They were able to identify three ex-boyfriends, and they were brought in for questioning. 
None of them could provide any insight into Beverly's murder, and they too were ruled out as suspects when their alibis checked out. Back at the crime scene, investigators called in sniffer dogs. They wanted to see if the sniffer dogs could track the escape route of Beverly's killer. They were able to follow a scent from the home to McCracken Road, which was near the family's home, but from here the scent dropped. Investigators speculated that Beverly's killer had escaped from this spot in a vehicle. They quickly began to focus on the theory that Beverly had been targeted by a secret admirer. Over the several months preceding Beverly's murder, she had been receiving gifts at home. The first time, a ring and a bracelet were found at the back door of the home, and the second time, a piece of costume jewellery was found in the mailbox. These gifts were all addressed to Beverly. Somebody had also made a number of phone calls to the home, but each time somebody picked up, they hung up the line. Sometimes this person called 10 to 12 times a day. The last phone call from the unknown person had come around three weeks earlier. Beverly's parents believed that the person leaving gifts and the person phoning was the same person, and they believed that it was somebody who was obsessed with their daughter. On another occasion, Thaddeus had come home at night and saw somebody standing on the front lawn. He was gazing into the bedroom that Beverly shared with her sister. Thaddeus attempted to chase the man, but he was far too quick. Beverly herself had been left feeling extremely uneasy by this unknown person. She always double-checked that the doors were locked and that her blinds were always drawn. Wherever she went, she always made sure to check in and let her parents know where she was and that she was okay. She had even taken to carrying a brass letter opener as protection. Down at the medical examiner's office, Coroner Samuel Gerber performed the autopsy. He found that Beverly had been stabbed around 40 times. A lot of the stab wounds were deep, but there were also slash wounds to her hands, face and chest. There were nine stab wounds to her back, from her neck, extending down her waist, and most of the stab wounds had been done in a series of three. It was also discovered that when Beverly was stabbed, she was wearing her clothing. Her killer then sliced the bloodied clothing from her. The pathologist also determined that Beverly had not been raped, but investigators working on the case still believed that the motive behind the murder was sexual. They suggested that the killer had been disturbed by Barbara knocking on the front door. The autopsy also found evidence of strangulation and Dr. Gerber commented that the stab wounds and strangulation indicated that the killer was a robust, rather large person, and suggested that it must have been a man who killed Beverly. The murder weapon had not been found at the crime scene, but Dr. Gerber suggested that the weapon was around four to five inches long. Beverly had died from a combination of stabbing and strangulation. The murder completely stumped investigators and Garfield Heights detectives called on the Cleveland police to assist. While the murder was certainly a frenzied one, there was a lack of evidence left behind at the crime scene. One investigator commented to the Sandusky Register, we're no nearer solution now than we were when the body was found. Maybe we're further away from one. In a bid to generate some much-needed leads, the Cleveland Press put forward a reward of $5,000 for information that could lead to the arrest and conviction of Beverly's killer. The pathologist suggested that the question of who had killed Beverly may lay with the rope. It had been determined that the rope had not come from Beverly's family's home. Instead, the killer had presumably brought it along with them. Two strips of the rope were knotted, while the third one was used to strangle Beverly. Investigators theorized that the nodding had been done before the killer entered the home, which indicated premeditation. With this new lead detective captain, William Horrigan, assigned five investigators to check the entire neighborhood for the source of the rope. These investigators noticed that a couple of residents in the neighborhood had used similar rope to tie back their bushes as protection from snow. But other than this, 
investigators could find no further insight. Detective Captain Horrigan would state in the media, We're looking for a brutal animal, but what does he look like? Just before midnight on the 1st of January, a 46-year-old man was stumbling along Ohio 82 in Grafton Township. He was mumbling something about a girl and a hold-up. Somebody who overheard him had become concerned and contacted police. The newspaper reports the following morning made it appear as though they had caught the killer of Beverly. But it turned out, the man was just drunk and disorderly. The following morning, rain plummeted down from the sky. Beverly's loved ones, acquaintances and strangers alike, ran from the dreary weather into St. Teresa Church in Garfield Heights. Around 1,000 people gathered for Beverly's funeral. A special police detail was assigned to the funeral as well. Sometimes, a killer will show up to their victim's funeral, sometimes as a way to relive the murder. Other times, to taunt police for their inability to capture them. As mourners shuffled into the church, plains clothes police officers stood watch, making a mental note of each person who entered the church. Pastor James Smith offered the funeral mass in both English and Latin. From the church, the funeral procession walked in the rain to the nearby cemetery. A tent was protecting the gravesite from the rainfall. Carnations were tossed into the grave before Beverly's casket was lowered down. The investigation was hit with another blow after Beverly's funeral, when Dr. Gerber announced that scientific testing of Beverly's fingernails, clothing, and materials from her bedroom had failed to shed any light on her murder. Without any leads to go on, investigators once again turned their attention to Beverly's former boyfriends. Beverly had dated 18-year-old Roger McNamara for the past seven months. In fact, they were still together when Beverly was killed. He voluntarily went on to the police station to be questioned. He revealed that he had been at Beverly's home the night before she was killed. Roger voluntarily submitted to a polygraph examination. While the science behind polygraph examinations has effectively ruled them as junk science, at the time they were considered accurate. Investigators on the case said that Roger passed the polygraph examination with flying colours and was therefore ruled out as a suspect. Another potential suspect came to light around the same time or at least a person of interest. Investigators travelled to Ash Tabula County Jail in Jefferson to speak with a 29-year-old man. This man had been jailed on charges of contributing to the delinquency of a 15-year-old girl. This man denied any involvement in Beverly's murder and he provided an airtight alibi. The first week of the investigation passed in a blur for Beverly's family. As the investigation entered its second week, detectives began looking at the possibility that Beverly could have been killed by a woman. They were considering this theory, but also still considering that Beverly had been killed by somebody she knew, or at least somebody who had been watching her. Lieutenant Carl DeLue, who was head of the Cleveland Homicide Unit, said, He went there for the express purpose of committing a crime. Therefore, I recommend more intensive questioning of friends, neighbours, friends of friends, more intensive investigation of collectors of any kind. I feel the answer lies here. A conference among all of the investigators was held to discuss potential theories and new angles to consider. It was said to be lucrative because this the following day, Captain William Horrigan said that a couple of theories had grown out of the conference. Investigators were subsequently seen back at Garfield Heights combing for clues. They said that they were now working on the theory that Beverly had in fact been killed by a woman. Dr Gerber commented, It has been my theory all along that either sex could have done it. This revelation led to rumours that Barbara was somehow involved in her best friend's slaying. Barbara was repeatedly harassed by prank phone calls and letters from people who accused her of killing Beverly. 
Sergeant Lee Peters would state in the media that Barbara was completely innocent and that she had long been ruled out as a suspect. Dr Gerber's colleague, Dr Lester Adelson, said that the only thing missing in the case was the killer, adding, we're almost embarrassed by the wealth of information. He went on to say that when a murder is so violent, then the killer will always leave something behind and take something of the victim with them. And in this case, they believe that the killer would have taken smears of Beverly's blood, the knife, and possibly hair, flesh, or threads. Just the following day, three men were picked up and brought in for questioning. These three men worked for an agency that collected old clothing and papers in Beverly's neighbourhood. Detective Captain Horrigan commented in the media, We're through with theories, and now we'll go on facts. Everyone we bring in for questioning now, and henceforth, is a suspect. We are either going to eliminate people, or begin arresting them from here on in. Many of those brought in will go on the lie machine. The three men were let go without charge when investigators determined that they were not suspects or persons of interest. Just a couple of hours later, the media began reporting on a 36-year-old suspect that was expected to be arrested. This suspect had emerged from eyewitness reports that said that he had been seen in Beverly's neighbourhood the summer beforehand and was seen watching Beverly as she sunbathed in her backyard. While investigators were looking at this unidentified man as a person of interest, they found rope at a place where he was known to frequent. While investigators were remaining tight-lipped on the case, it was reported in the media that the man had been interviewed at least once, and rope that was found was being compared to the rope at the crime scene. The rope that was used to bind and strangle Beverly was a massive piece of evidence and investigators were determined to figure out what kind of rope it was. Ted Moss, who was owner of South Eastern Cordage Company, identified the rope as window sash cord, which is a piece of rope attached to the inside of a window. However, when he examined the rope further, he came to the conclusion that the rope had most likely been used as a clothesline. Ted made inquiries with five of the companies that manufactured around 90% of all window sash cord in the United States and was hoping that they could offer some more insight into the rope. As inquiries were being made to find the manufacturer of the rope in question, the 36-year-old man who was hailed as the lead suspect in the case was ruled out. The reason he was ruled out as a suspect was because he had passed a polygraph examination. On the 9th of January... A young couple had been walking in the woodland just off Ohio 231, near Tiffin. As they strolled along, they made a gruesome discovery. It was the body of a teenage girl. Police were dispatched to the scene and the body was transported to the local medical examiner's office for an identification to hopefully be made and for a cause of death to be determined. The girl was identified as 16-year-old Tharon Shepard who had vanished a couple of days earlier after she walked to a nearby drugstore to purchase a notepad. Tharn had been raped and then strangled with one of her own stockings. The similarities between her murder and the murder of Beverly were quite evident. They were both teenage girls and both had been strangled to death. Furthermore, both of them had their clothing ripped off and it was found scattered around their bodies. The spectre of a serial killer was looming in the air. But investigators would eventually rule out that the cases were somehow connected. Joseph Esselman was convicted of Tharn's murder, but it was determined that he was not involved in Beverly's murder. Investigators would get their new lead shortly thereafter, when they received information from a 20-year-old inmate at Mansfield Reformatory. This inmate was serving a burglary sentence and told investigators he knew Beverly in late 1963 and early 1964. He gave investigators the names of several acquaintances that they should look into. At the time of Beverly's murder, the acquaintance was in prison, so he wasn't a suspect himself. Detective Captain Horrigan said that they were going to be looking into each name. 
He further revealed that a lot of Beverly's acquaintances and friends had taken polygraph examinations. And when they passed, they were immediately ruled out as suspects. As investigators were looking into these potential persons of interest, 17-year-old Lindley Bain was found dead in the basement of his home in Garfield Heights by his sister. Lindley had taken his own life with a shotgun. He had propped the shotgun up against his chest and then used a pencil to reach the trigger. Lindley was a junior at Garfield Heights High School, much like Beverly was, and rumours began running rampant throughout the community that Lindley had killed Beverly, and unable to cope with the grief, he had then taken his own life. This was something that investigators considered. In fact, when they searched his room, they found a picture of a girl which was signed Bev. This picture was shown to Beverly's loved ones, and they said that it wasn't Beverly. Investigators then compared Lindley's fingerprints to the unknown fingerprints found at the crime scene, and found that they did not match. Lindley was ruled out of the murder investigation, leaving investigators back at square one. The investigation returned to the rope that was used to kill Beverly. By now, it had been determined that the rope had most likely come from a Maryland rope manufacturing firm. The firm reported that the rope was an extremely common variety and was retailed by dealers throughout the United States. Finding who had purchased the rope would be like finding a proverbial needle in a haystack. Another suspect would emerge towards the end of January when 22-year-old William Rehard was arrested for the abduction of seven-year-old Donna Adkins. At the time, he had been on parole from the Ohio State Reformatory for assaulting a six-year-old girl. He had abducted Donna and admitted that he planned on keeping her for the rest of his life. Thankfully, Donna had not been seriously physically harmed, and Rehard had dropped her off after taking photographs of her. When Rehard was arrested, he told investigators that he had been the one to kill Beverly. He pointed to the location where he claimed he had left the murder weapon. But nothing ever came of this confession, and no weapon was ever found. In a hope to generate some much-needed tips, the Cleveland Press announced that they were increasing the reward fund from $5,000 to $10,000. It was a massive reward considering the annual household income at the time was $6,000. One interesting tip would be received from Virgil Austin, who was a guard at the Cleveland Museum of Art. He informed investigators that Beverly had been at the museum one Sunday afternoon in the summer. He observed a man following Beverly through the exhibition rooms. Beverly was a frequent guest at the museum, so Virgil recognised her. He described the man as having a look of intense hatred in his eyes. He said that if looks could kill, Beverly would have died on the spot. Virgil described the man as a young man who was tall and slim, but he never got closer than 20 feet from Beverly, and he never interacted with her. As investigators were trying to identify this elusive man, another potential tip came in. At around 7.40 a.m. on the day that Beverly was killed, a 1964 Chevrolet car was stolen from outside a home in Langton Avenue. This was just a two-minute walk away from Beverly's home. Detectives decided to dig deeper, and they found that at around 3.30pm that afternoon, which was after Beverly had been killed, the car was found burned out in a field in Cleveland's southeast side. Investigators examined the car thoroughly to see if they could somehow link it to Beverly's murder, but they were unable to do so. They determined that the car's motor transmission and wheels had been removed presumably by car strippers, and then the rest of it was set alight. Investigators would then learn of a middle-aged man who appeared at a medical building near Beverly's home shortly after she was killed. The man was estimated to be between 40 and 45 years old, and he was seeking medical aid for a severe cut to his left hand. At the time, the doctor wasn't in the medical building, so a receptionist sent the man to a hospital. However, the man never showed up at the hospital. So this was now two persons of interest that first of all needed to be identified and tracked down. 
another potential person of interest would emerge in Athens, Ohio. It was a 15-year-old transient teenager who had been missing from his Bridgewater, Pennsylvania home for around two months. When his bag was searched by investigators, they found a blood-stained shirt, a blood-stained bayonet, a pistol, two small pocket knives, and a money belt which contained ammunition, a hacksaw, and a blackjack. The youth was arrested and questioned in relation to Beverly's murder, but there was nothing that could link him to the case. Investigators were essentially back at square one. Each tip they investigated only led to a dead end. Then on the 16th of February, Gerda Lady was home alone in Elyria, Ohio, when she heard a knock at the front door. She opened up the front door to find an encyclopedia salesman. Gerda was intrigued, so she invited the man inside. Once inside, however, the man turned on her. He tried to force her into the bedroom, and when she resisted, he placed his hand over her mouth and stabbed her in the stomach before fleeing. Gerda called police and was transported to the hospital where she made a full recovery. She described her assailant as standing at around six foot and weighing around 195 pounds. He was identified a 17-year-old Harry Maddell Jr. from Garfield Heights, and he was arrested at an Eastside hotel the following day. Detectives working on Beverly's murder decided that they would question him in relation to the case, because the cases bore some similarities. Maddell Jr. would make a full confession to stabbing Gerda, but he denied any involvement in Beverly's murder. He lived around a mile and a half away from Beverly's home, and he provided an alibi for the date that she was killed. However, investigators soon learned that his alibi did not check out. The attack on Gerda wasn't the first attack Maddell Jr. had carried out either. He had assaulted two women at knife point back in 1963, and he had also chillingly told investigators that whenever he gets disturbed, he finds a knife in his hand. Much like all of the previous persons of interest in the case, detectives had Maddell Jr. take a polygraph examination. The results came back as inconclusive, and he was ruled out of the inquiries. The month slowly trickled past, and Beverly's family were desperate for a conclusion. All of the leads up until this point had not been lucrative, and investigators were no closer to finding Beverly's killer than they were on day one. Eventually, the months turned into years and then the years turned into decades. On the 20th of August 1988, Detective Captain William Horrigan was at home when his phone began to ring. Horrigan was now long retired, but the murder case and his inability to solve it had haunted him for the past 25 years. Over the years, Horrigan had received a number of tips, even after he retired. People found his phone number in the phone book, and while he was retired, he always made sure to follow up these tips. He knew the case like the back of his hand, and he still clung on to that glimmer of hope that one day, a lucrative tip would come in and lead him directly to Beverly's killer. The person on the other end of the line told Horrigan that he knew who had killed Beverly, but he didn't really provide any information. Around 20 minutes later, Horrigan received a second phone call. The caller asked Horrigan if he would meet him at Captain Frank's Pier, located on East 9th Street. Horrigan met with the man, but unfortunately, it was just another dead end in a case that was plagued with dead ends. Beverly's father, Thaddeus, was still living in the home where Beverly was killed by 1989, at the 25-year anniversary. He and Beverly's mother, Eleanor, sadly divorced in 1980. Quite often, the strain of an unsolved murder of a child can be unfixable in marriages. That was the case with Eleanor and Thaddeus. They struggled to even say Beverly's name, but as Eleanor said, it was there under the surface 
always. As the 25-year anniversary was approaching, Thaddeus refused to do an interview. He said that it would open up a lot of old wounds and he wasn't emotionally prepared. However, he did reveal that in the years after Beverly was killed, he had received a handful of phone calls from somebody who claimed that they had wasted Beverly. He stated, He didn't say why and he never gave his name. He sounded high on drugs. Horrigan died in 2004 at the age of 93. He went to his grave with regrets that he could never crack the case. Thaddeus then died in 2012. He had remained inside the family's home for all of those years, even keeping it the same as it was in 1964, on the chance that a jury would one day need to view the home as it presented itself back then. In 2018, Eleanor also died. They both passed away without ever knowing who had killed their eldest daughter. Today, all of the evidence relating to the murder of Beverly sits in a six-drawer filing cabinet in the basement of the police station. Over the years, some tips would trickle in, but nothing that could crack the case open. According to the investigators who worked on the homicide, Beverly was most likely killed by somebody that she had known. Somebody that she had welcomed into the family home. The caller who identified himself as Stephen Stankowitz was never identified by investigators, but they were able to determine that the name was a fictional one. Beverly's loved one strongly believed that Beverly was targeted by a stalker, and that stalker was the same person who had been leaving her gifts and calling the family home. Before Eleanor passed away, she said to the plain dealer, I had a premonition. Every time I looked at Beverly, I was concerned about her. I thought something was going to happen to her body. The only premonition I ever had. Years after William Rehard made the confession to Beverly's murder, Detective Vincent Farini's son-in-law, George Pelota, claimed that Rehard had in fact led Detective Farini to a butcher's trimming knife. But in addition to that, he led him to items of clothing that were believed to have come from Beverly. He claimed that these items were locked at a Greyhound bus station locker. Unfortunately, Rehar took his own life shortly after he made the verbal confession. He never made a written confession, and he never provided any more insight. According to George, Detective Farini asked to see the evidence but he was informed that it had been destroyed. He claimed the police rejected the evidence regarding Rehard. According to police at the time, however, there was no record of any knife being turned into evidence in relation to the case. It was just another mystery on top of a case plagued with mysteries. Over the years, there were a handful of leads and tips that came in. But as one detective said, we're no nearer a solution now than we were when the body was found. For all I know, we're further away from one. A reporter on the case referred to some of the tips as leading investigators down paths paved with hope, then turned into labyrinths of frustration. Well, besties, that is it for this episode of Morbidology. As always, thank you so, so much for listening. I'd like to say a big, massive thank you to my lovely new Patreon supporter, Nikki. You can join Morbidology on Patreon for as little as $1 a month, and you can cancel any time. There are absolutely no obligations. In exchange for your support, you get bonus episodes of Morbidology Plus that aren't on the regular podcast platforms ad-free and early release episodes behind the scenes which includes bonus audio videos and case files and i also send out a handwritten thank you card and some cool merch if you follow me on social media you've maybe seen that i'm going to be at crime con in glasgow on the 10th of september it's just a one-day event 
and I'll be on podcast row all day. I really hope that some of you can make it, and I have a 10% discount code. Just head to crimecon.co.uk and enter the promo code MORBID for 10% off your ticket. Also remember to visit us at morbidology.com for more information about this episode and to read our true crime articles. And please stay tuned to the end of this episode to hear a promo for the amazing true crime podcast, Clueless. Until next time, take care of yourselves, stay safe, and have an amazing week. Something is creeping don't follow it down. Let me introduce you to Barry Clue, an authorised financial advisor from New Zealand and a very special kind of stain on humanity. He was a very uh, knowledgeable young guy. He was a registered financial advisor. The type of guy that was bending over backwards to help you. Now, you could be forgiven for thinking that Barry sounds like a great guy. And you'd be right. Well, right up until the point when you're wrong. It was all fictitious.